So I'm James Bennett. At the moment, yeah. I'm CEO of ByteTree, which is an on-chain analytics platform. On-chain, okay. Um, can you tell me more about ByteTree? What does it do? Yeah, sure. So um, we take information off of blockchains, which is complex and difficult to read, unformatted. Yeah. Translate it into a language that people can understand in order to um, inform their investment decisions and help them kind of understand what's going on in these on these networks. Yeah, we certainly look at price. Um, so one of the most interesting things about on-chain data is that you can see the uh, patterns and types of transactions that are happening on the different networks. So if we think about this ongoing debate about what is Bitcoin, is it a payment network, is it digital cash, is it gold, um, what is Bitcoin cash, is that kind of the equivalent um, kind of cash version of, of Bitcoin, what is Litecoin, is it really a silver to, to Bitcoin being a gold, mm -hmm. and at the moment there are a lot of opinions about what those different mm -hmm. kind of networks are and what these terms mean, but what we're doing is actually looking at the you know, raw data mm -hmm. on chain and being able to you know, distinguish which one does what. I think um, it did start off as a payment network yeah. and still carries a large amount of the um, transaction value that happens on blockchain networks is carried across you know, Bitcoin. So we see about two to three billion dollars a day of mm -hmm. value trans transferred on the, on the Bitcoin network. Okay. Um, and then second is Litecoin um, and after that you have Bitcoin Cash and then you know the rest but those three are really making up the majority of payments mm -hmm. but what's interesting is if you say okay yeah you know, if, if I give you a number two to three billion yeah. in a day yeah. and I tell you that there are three thousand transactions um, in every block there's a block every ten minutes you could sort of extrapolate that there's a lot of you know mid-value transactions going on, but it could also be the case that there are 2,900 transactions every block that are zero, and there's one transaction that has a huge amount of, of value in it. Or perhaps all of the transactions through the day are like 0 0.01, mm -hmm. and there's just one $2 billion transaction a day. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of which is of those scenarios is a more valuable network, it's the one where, in my opinion, where you have the most number of users exchanging that value you know, across them, rather than just two wallets sending money back and forth mm -hmm. to each other. So having that total transferred number alone and the number of transactions alone doesn't actually give us enough information, mm -hmm. especially in a space where people are um, gaming these metrics mm -hmm. in order to you know, make the case that they are a better crypto, a more valuable crypto. And that's what we've seen with the whole Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. is, you know, oh look, we do you know, this many more transactions and this is our total value, but okay, who, who are doing these transactions? Mm -hmm. like, we really want to get in and see them. Mm -hmm. So what we're working on at the moment is mm -hmm. a heat map. Okay. So that for all the transactions that occur in a block through the day, you can see the distribution of value, you know, in, in terms of low value, high value. And you can see this wave of movement, you know, where um, there are different patterns at certain times of day and when price moves in a certain way, you know, the different people interact with, with the, the network. Um, and yeah, I, I just find it fascinating. So I see it as the economy of blockchains or blockchain economies. So it's really like who cares about, you know, if you look at the traditional economy, who cares about employment figures, who cares about GDP and you know, um, balance of trade and, and things like that. Um, various different kind of financial services um, and, and investor groups that are plugged into you know, that into the economy that the data is relevant for. So I see the same you know, for, for the um, blockchain data. It's like if you are using um, the Bitcoin network for something, 
like sending you know a payment you want to know that you're not the only one doing it because that would mean that your kind of payment is a very large amount of the total uh, value on the network at that time which mm -hmm. is a risk so yeah anyone that's plugging into the into the various um, blockchain networks needs to know if they're legit Bitcoin seems the most legitimate. I mean, we're, what we're seeing at the moment is actually the highest um, number of transactions in terms of the value bands is between 50 and $100. So there's this constant stream. And by the time this interview goes out, you know, I'm sure we'll have it live on the ByteTree website. Mm -hmm. So you have to check it out. Mm -hmm. But you can just see this stream of dark red, which is telling you this is the highest number of transactions, like a river running through this distribution. And it's on that fifty to hundred dollar mark, mm. and then you've got you know the kind of hundred thousand to to a couple of million is relatively weak, you know. So it's it, it, there's not much activity, and then the top layer, you know, you have these dappled bits of like twenty million dollars or or you know um, fifty million dollars, or sometimes a billion dollars. Even last week we saw you know a billion dollar transaction. There is a plethora of information available on blockchain networks, but the pseudonymous nature of these actors means that you know we can't directly say whether it's a Starbucks or you know a student or a doctor receiving you know payments, sending payments, whatever. Um, so there are different companies looking at describing exactly who these addresses belong to. Um, and then you know that would be the answer to your question. What we're doing is using it more as a um, so defining heuristics around the activity of these bands, and then kind of relating that back into the real world. So we don't like the idea of tracking specific addresses and identifying the exact purpose. You know, like yeah. what are you buying? Yeah. Or where are you buying it? But we care about it, whether it's like, you know, like um, large value, low value, like a lot of, it. could it be a lot of retail? retail? Could it be uh, a lot of information? So if you see loads of transactions that are like less than $1, I don't believe that those transactions are um, being used as payments. Mm -hmm. They could either be like, you know, um, done before sending a large transaction to a wallet, so like a test payment, or more likely, those transactions are carrying other bits of information on the Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. And to come back to that kind of um, point about what is the Bitcoin network, mm -hmm. you know, it's also uh, a centralized, or sorry, a, a decentralized, but a public ledger that anyone can use to settle um, the their uh, information on. Look at the on-chain analytics space. Mm -hmm. You can break it up into, you know, the, di the different players looking at kind of two areas. One is, um, or even three areas. Um, what one is like surveillance of different users on the network. So that would be chain analysis, elliptic. Now those are the guys that want to catch. The baddies, um, you know, the the uh, regulatory bodies or governments would come and ask, you'd pay them lots of money to find out, you know, who's uh, this person. You know, who, are the the bad guys. <laughs> who are the bad guys? Okay. We don't really like that. I think it's that's the kind of snooping that is not, you know, in, 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 in like it, it's not what this whole space was about. Um, people deserve to be able to have freedom if they want you know, to do things anonymously. Um, but then you've got the other side of it, which is, uh, yeah, like I said, the, econ the economies of blockchains, um, which defines like the legitimacy of these different networks. And then that is segues into the third part, which is you know, trading and investing. Um, so, you know, as with any kind of 
financial market and to an extent crypto is you know digital finance people invest and trade these different crypto assets um, and so yeah there's you can use this data to kind of get an edge if you like so yes right like um, we provide an API feed of on-chain data so all of the kind of information you can see on the terminal um, which is bytree.com that can be downloaded into an Excel and you can then work with the data to find that you know the, the most relevant bits of information for you so I came into this from a um, sort of crypto asset research mm -hmm. point of view which was okay, everyone's poking around in the dark with the blindfolds on about what is the price of Bitcoin, what should it be? And so I wanted to find a way to kind of construct a valuation model mm. uh, based on you know the data of the network. And so to a large extent, I think that's what people should use the data for. I think one of the great things about Bitcoin is that there's no central um, you know, point of failure. And so despite people having tried to do coordinated attacks on the network, they failed. And off the back of that, the network's become stronger. And the fact that they had, there was an attack and the attack failed and the network became stronger means that it's kind of leveled up in terms of its trustworthiness. So then people need to try and attack it harder. And you know, hopefully they would fail um, because the cost is continually increasing of an attack, um, and that would then make it stronger again. Um, in terms of like the the philosophy of Bitcoin, I just think it's phenomenal that you can have this decentralized public um, ledger that anyone can contribute to and anyone can sort of check and validate. Um, and no one can interfere with. It's like the ultimate game of Chinese whispers, globally. Um, except that, you know, the whisper never gets lost, because because it's there. It's indelible on the blockchain. That's why I like. I think privacy should be a choice. Mm -hmm. So, ultimately. Um, there are opportunities for people to, you know, use the Bitcoin network privately. There's wallets like um, Samurai and I think it's called Wasabi, uh, or um, that that have privacy as a sort of default feature. So you can just have an app on your phone that's your wallet, and you can send money you know, privately, and um, no one can kind of review that. But then on the other hand, you've got services like Jack's wallet that was one of the most popular um, kind of uh, computer-based wallets that then came in and said everyone needs to do KYC and they lost a huge number of their customers but they'll get new ones you know that don't care about privacy but I just think it's important that people have a choice in this space and it's all about choices so if you have uh, a private wallet then that maintains privacy um, okay um, to a degree because okay. it also depends where did you Initially, you know, purchase acquire that Bitcoin, um, but it, yeah, there are certain features. So, you know, Grin, Beam have you know privacy by default. You've got Zcash and Monero that have you know a degree, a slightly lesser degree of privacy. And then you've got you know Bitcoin isn't private by default, but there are services that you can uh, interact with the Bitcoin network through that it gives you privacy. Um, Again, I think it should be a choice. I think it should be a choice. Like, when, when it comes to um, interacting with you know, existing regulated uh, environments, like receiving your salary and paying you know, sales tax and paying income tax, and I, I, like, if you want to use crypto to do that, I think to a degree you need to be transparent with where that money came from. Um, because otherwise, you know, the whole system breaks down. People that just want, you know, I shouldn't pay. Ta I should be able to be entirely pri private because I don't think I should be taxed. 
Well, then, you know, don't live in a city that's got no, like a public health service that you can go in, you know, with a, with a hole in your head and get patched up and not get septicemia and be, you know, back on, on your feet in a couple of weeks, all for free. And then you're saying you don't want to pay taxes. It's like, you know, there's, there's a trade-off there. But now if you want to send money to your family who are in Iran or even in North Korea or... Um, and you know that's a personal thing. You want to support your family, and there's some government saying, "Oh no, you can't do that because you know, there are sanctions on the on these countries." Then, by all means, in, in my opinion, that should be allowed to be done privately because that's you know that's not um, something that the state, in my opinion, should control. Where you draw the line is a difficult question, but you know, those are two very polar. Yeah, opposites. that seems quite difficult balance to strike because you want maybe. Um it to be auditable, maybe, to some certain extent, but you also want it to remain private to transfer money to different parts of the world and stuff. That's interesting. Um, so, um, and it's e that's easy to do, right? Yeah. Is it? That's easy to do. Because a, like, a transaction can go from public, if you like, let's say public to private, mm -hmm. through one kind of process. Yeah, mm -hmm. Call it a coin mixer. Okay. And now it's private. And now, if you want to spend that private coin, they could say, no, because I can't see the source of where this came from, so you know, clearly it's obfuscated, this isn't a valid you know, currency, if you like. But then you go, um, you can turn that private coin back into public again by saying, oh no, yeah, that's me, I own this. But if it, when you're putting it into a mixer and you turn it into a private coin, yeah. um, does that, you know, and then it becomes, um, opaque to the government at that point. Yeah. And, and then, and then it, I guess it requires uh, the government trusting the individual to pay the income tax, mm, right? Mm, yeah. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's quite interesting that um, I guess we place a lot of trust in governments, but also the government's now maybe having to trust us as individuals and mm. citizens, mm. and that creates some kind of agency. I mean, I guess you still have, you know, the government still tr not trusts you, but you fill out your own income tax, I guess, and say how much you earn and like, say how much your company fees are and stuff. I guess that requires some level of trust, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's quite interesting. It is really interesting. So looking at the distribution of hash power, so, you know, the network guardians, if you like, and seeing where that is concentrated and or, and how concentrated it is. So, you know, geographically, um, as well as like based under one entity, um, because those, that's, that's another risk to the network. You know, if you had a massive mining center in, um, in China, then that could ha uh, control more than 50% of the network, then, you know, there's a kind of existential threat there to, to the Bitcoin network. So we need to keep an eye on those kind of things. So I think we talked about number of users, so mm -hmm. like, um, broadly categorizing, because exchange, um, broadly categorizing wallets so that we can understand, you know, what is driving the kind of on-chain activity. So we talked a bit earlier about, you know, using different heuristics to uh, group people into different types of, of, of transactions but also being able to say, this is a whale wallet because it owns more than a thousand Bitcoin. And this is a, an exchange because you can see the amount of activity that goes in and out of exchanges and they, they've also been kind of publicly labeled. Um, and then you can start to say, you know, 20% of the traffic is, is um, going to exchanges or coming from exchanges. So you can say, well, that's speculative activity or you know, however you want to define it. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Okay, any others? Um, I think layer two solutions. So, mm -hmm. looking at you know Lightning Network and and Liquid, which are so Lightning Network's slightly easier to to track the amount of activity going on. Uh, Liquid, which is the uh, Blockstream kind of side chain, um, is much more difficult to track the kind of uh, activity that's going on. 
Also looking into the op return functions, so essentially these little backpacks that sit on top of every transaction on the Bitcoin network that can carry other bits of information. So uh, you've probably heard of Tether, the, the Bitfinex kind of US dollar backed stablecoin, and that runs on partly on the Bitcoin network, so it sits on top of the Bitcoin network on the Omni layer, um, and that that's pretty cool because you know you can you can see the amount of value going across the Bitcoin network, but then there's an additional value kind of sitting on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then if you think that people could be potentially you know trading their um, like hard assets, like property, property rights. Technically, you could put that into a Bitcoin transaction in the op return function, but you don't see that, you know, in the in the um, transaction metrics. So you need to dig deeper. You can do that to an extent. Okay. So, so here's a fun example. Yeah. Um, if you see a large transaction like a hundred million dollars plus mm -hmm. going to an exchange wallet, what do you think is the intention of that? So I see a hundred million of Bitcoin going to an exchange to sell. Yeah. So we can see that there's going to be a big amount of Bitcoin coming into an exchange. Yeah. It's pretty unlikely that they're just going to put it on the exchange and you know sit yeah. on it for a while because exchange you know custody is outside of their control to yeah. an extent. Um, and so, yeah, we expect the price to go down because Sorry, down. people, yeah. yeah, because people yeah. sell depending yeah. on the, yeah. the liquidity of the exchange, and, uh, yeah. and we see that. So you can, again, like we're trying to build the tools to help everyone to see this in real time. So on the Bytree platform, if you click onto an asset like Bitcoin, we've got the price graph with the exchange uh, volume, so you can see the candlesticks for the for the price, and then you can have a, a, an overlay. Um, of the on-chain transaction activity. So it means I can see the candlesticks and then I can see how much activity was happening on the chain around those candlesticks. So broadly speaking, when you see you know, a big on-chain transaction, it coincides shortly uh, before you know, a um, drop in the price. Mm -hmm. And do you see a flurry of activity after the candlesticks, like big transactions, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, so you, um, so you can see that see that on the data. So you have like a big whale making a big transaction, and then you have. I imagine a, on your heat map there will be a flurry of activity. Absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, um, and are there are there any other ways to like? Uh, yeah, just to predict, not like you know, forecast the price of Bitcoin or to, yeah. In terms of valuations or shorter um, term? Shorter term, like what you were just talking about. Mm. Um, I don't think so. I think on-chain, like watching, because essentially what big price movements are is either coming from information that someone has that hasn't been priced in already, or um, you know, like large on-chain transactions. So on-chain transactions we can view if people know something that we don't you can't see that in the in the data um, yet yet because this is I'm just thinking out loud mm -hmm. right this yeah, is yeah. something where we want to where I'd, I'd like to explore is when you do have this transaction heat map over a much longer period of time because right now we're looking 100 blocks at a time if you could look at this you know, around all these different like major um, price movements, I think you would see a lot of interesting patterns in the data that could enable you to sort of anticipate um, big changes in price. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea of like the tipping, like it being a tipping point. Mm -hmm. So you can see this like wave of energy building up. Um, and that you know, at some point, uh, this wave gets like a, its momentum up, and it, that's that hits a tipping point where suddenly it can kind of explode and grow exponentially. Um, so I think by having that data, because 
what you're seeing is um, people's interaction with the network in real time. Mm. So it would be like having, you know, not just the exchange traded data, but like the retail data. Like imagine MasterCard or, or, or Visa mm -hmm. and what they could see in terms of spending patterns around a certain time and how that might you know, lead on to certain other events. Um, yeah, I just there, there's so much information there. Yeah. Uh, and and it's accessible to you know people like us that don't own the network because it's a public network. What's interesting is I guess you know maybe these whales might also use data um, for their own purposes. Like you know if they realize oh maybe the commun like this is how the data is being interpreted, if I make a big movement into an exchange wallet that's being interpreted as price quality, um, but as a selling pattern, I mean, this might be just obvious stuff, but yeah, no, it's not couldn't, they just, like, couldn't they just perform that and then not sell and then pour it back? Yes. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So it becomes quite Absolutely. an interpretive exercise yeah. and the rules of the games are continuously changing. Continuously changing. Okay, that's quite interesting. Mm. Um, but that's um, so I don't have a trading background. Yeah. You know, um, but from what I've learned in the last couple of years of being in the space and sort of diving deeper into this, mm -hmm. is that is essentially how this trading game works. Mm -hmm. you know, if there's an advantage that you have because of information that other people don't have, mm -hmm. you can exploit oh. that for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. and then people catch up and you need to find a new, you know, approach. Mm -hmm. um, or you need to refine your approach. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it is competition in, it, in its truest form. And as a maybe as a data provider or an analyzer, maybe like your interpretive game also has to change with it. Maybe a hundred percent. Yeah. All the time. Mm -hmm. So you know, I've got a list of about fifty different kind of metrics. Mm -hmm. Some that I've seen from other people, and some that you know I've thought up that I want to implement going forward and I don't think that will ever I hope that list will be growing as yeah. we're going through it you know because yeah. um, it's just c continuous questions that's that's what I find interesting so how do you we've explored these questions earlier but like how do you find the most relevant metrics to use I guess in finance maybe you know you've got a big uh, guy at Goldman or something analyzer economist and and then someone might follow him or something. But in this space, there's no one setting that kind of mm. trend. So how do you find out, like, this is the metric that, like, is best represents this community? Or do you talk to economists or mm. advisors or techies? How does it work? I think it, it starts with curiosity mm -hmm. and an understanding of what you're looking at. Mm. Um, and then understanding what is important for the, you know, the person. Um, and then kind of going deeper from that. So as an example, like if I want to send you some cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and you're you know blockchain agnostic, you don't you don't care which one, you just want you know the, what's going to be quickest. Or maybe you just want what's going to be the most secure. Um, or maybe you know the most liquid because you know you you don't want to have like price slippage when you turn it back into fiat which is your end goal and depending on what your kind of motivation is for transacting on this network will depend on or will define which network you should probably use so because litecoin has two and a half minute block times versus bitcoin's 10 minute you know it's essentially four times faster um, which means that and, and fees are also lower because the blocks aren't as full. Um, which means that if I want to send money quickly, um, I would use Litecoin. And I did in 2017, you know, when the Bitcoin network was congested and there were all sorts of um, attacks going on from like Bitcoin Cash. Um, and I just wanted to send money from one wallet to another, or from one exchange to another exchange to buy different cryptos. And I used Lite, uh, Litecoin because it was cheaper, quicker, faster. And I didn't care I don't care about like the long term appreciation of the Litecoin. I just wanted to use Litecoin as a as a means of getting from point A to point B. If you then ask me, you know, I've got to send a hundred million dollars 
um, to uh, to you, then would I rather use the Litecoin network or the Bitcoin network? Well, the Bitcoin network because it has a much uh, more competitive uh, mining sort of infrastructure that means essentially it's more secure. So in terms of like rollbacks uh, of the chain would be more difficult. So you know, high value, I would want to use that more secure platform, even if I pay more fees and even if it takes longer. Um, You'd want something more secure. I'd want something more secure, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, do you do any uh, sentiment analysis or what do you think about sentiment analysis within this space? I think it's great. And we don't really we don't do it because we really focus on on chain data, mm. but I follow it like cu with curiosity because, mm. um, at least in twenty seventeen, I mean everything was about sentiment. So the price would move ridiculous amounts just based on you know tweets from John McAfee. In what world is? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating, and I've been following a couple of projects that are tracking it. Um, but you know, where we're talking about gamifying mm -hmm. metrics, gamifying Bitcoin metrics is quite hard because there's a cost associated, and because we have, you know, all this information that we can relatively easily spot, you know, fake traffic. Whereas it's slightly more difficult if you're just looking at like number of Twitter followers and their interactions and and um, you know maybe github activity because doing it doing that quantitatively you know people can easily gain that um, people that are doing sentiment analysis like qualitatively like really kind of getting inside of the minds of the community and understanding their like um, loyalty or, or resilience or you know um, kind of ambition to grow the, the project there you can see where the, you know that kind of analysis becomes really, really important. Mm. But that's that's a lot of yeah digging. I was thinking of writing an article about uh, just hodling um, the concept and the idea. It's quite a simple idea that and what it means within the space. So maybe you know you can share your own thoughts on it. So for me, I think I'm interested in it as a concept because. I guess it came out of this two that like this post on December tenth or eighteenth, two thousand thirteen or something like that. Mm. Uh, by this guy GameQB obviously and then you know, what's interesting about it was that you know, he said he admits that you know, I'm not the best trader in the world. You've read the post, I think it, have you read the I think I've read the post. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, he rants about how he's not the best trader in the world. Yeah. And so, like, I'm not going to, like, sell or whatever, buy. I'm just going to hold or hold, Right? And I think, you know, I have a lot of theories about that. Maybe that hodling was an important concept to not listen to, like, legacy thinkers who constantly said, like, oh, Bitcoin's going to die or this is going to die. And it became, like, an important mantra within the Bitcoin world and maybe gave um, rise, you know, you were able to, it was quite important for to be able to shut off, you know, there's been apparently, like, 365 Bitcoin deaths from, like, 99 obituary websites, you know. So it was quite important wow. to ignore the... Yeah, it's just a website that tells you how many times Bitcoin has been reported dead. Um, so it was quite important not to listen to the legacy community and I think hodling was an important term in that. And also, I guess now, you know, when projects want people to hold on to their coins more, they invoke this sentiment of hodling, so. Uh, is that, is that, that bit's dangerous. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree in terms of uh, resilience and mm. like long-term thinking, mm -hmm. like you said, refusing to kind of be spooked by mm. legacy thinkers. Um, but then it became so dangerous because people were hodling shit coins, you know, mm. to to their death, and everyone was kind of chanting, you know, swaying and chanting like mm. "must hodl, must hodl, <laughs> must hodl." And you look back on it and you're like, "Shit, what, what was I thinking?" Mm. Hodling Bitcoin is completely different to hodling like. A random shitcoin that you know you read about on Twitter and didn't do any due diligence into. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have any network activity, mm -hmm. and that's again where on-chain stuff comes into it. Is and why I became so interested with it is because 
if you look at a coin that's meant to be used for like in-game purchases or something and there's no one playing the game or you look at the on-chain activity and there's like ten dollars a month mm -hmm. transacting it didn't work mm -hmm. you know it's not it's not doing what it's supposed to there's no utility there it does nothing you know and there's a, a billion of them by the way and only five people that care so what's going to happen over time but people go, oh, this is the future, and they hodl, and it's it's toxic, it's it's sad, and um, yeah, yeah, hodling in the wrong thing might be, yeah, yeah, it's a powerful ideology, maybe, but it also might be destructive. Absolutely agree. To make data, yeah, that's a great one. So you can look at um, addresses on a network and that hold coins and see how long they've been holding those coins for and what points do they sell at. Mm, yeah. So you can you can see that if money moved or coins moved into a wallet in December 17 and haven't moved out of there since, you can be fairly sure if it's not Bitcoin that they're at like a 95% loss. And the way you can do that is because you can see Okay, let's use the example of Bitcoin because I know the numbers. Um, let's say you bought Bitcoin at 18 and a half grand on the 15th of December. So you can see that go into the wallet. That hasn't moved since. The price today is 10 grand. So you know that they're sitting at a loss of like eight and a half grand, that particular wallet. And you can do that across any kind of crypto wallet and say this is when you know they bought it or, or when they kind of moved it and it hasn't moved since. So that's their profit and loss, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, so you can analyse like hodler groups if you define a hodler as someone that's held from a certain time period or based on um, you know a number of months or years or or whatever. Once you set those parameters, you can see hodl groups. So and see how hodl groups change their behaviour around you know different times of year or insights. Or yeah, it might be a different good metric to compare faith in uh, a project maybe to see like, okay, even if it's during these downturns that they hold on to their things. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. But you see, all, a lot of these questions that yeah. people have, you can answer with on-chain data. Yeah. And it's just a case of um, you know, going through the process. Like the information's there, mm -hmm. you just need to categorize it, define it, index it, mm -hmm. and, and basically crunch it because they're big data sets. Yeah, and find the relevant metric. And find what's relevant, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, I think it's fascinating how resilient you know, this, the public crypto asset market has been considering the crash, if you like, that we had. And that there is so much positive kind of momentum going on in like, continuously legitimizing you know, the Bitcoin network and Ethereum and, and Litecoin and a lot of those in the kind of top 20. Um, so, you know, for people that might think that this space isn't going to survive, I would tell them to look deeper um, because the roots are getting so wide uh, that, you know, it'd be very, very difficult to bring it down. I think it's, it's a train that's not stopping at this point.